Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Is anybody glad that you have another day? Another day on earth? Another day to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Let's look to the Lord in word of prayer. Father, we thank you because you are so good to us. You are a good, good father. In spite of us, your love just keeps crashing over us. You keep loving us over and over again. In spite of us, you keep running after us, you keep chasing us down, you keep grabbing us and pulling us back. What manner of love? We thank you this morning for your love. We thank you, God, in spite of us, you still love us. We realize and recognize that we're not worthy of your undoing, your undying, your indescribable love. But God, thank you anyhow, because you've just been so good to us. In fact, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And we want to say thank you this morning. We thank you for this great privilege, this great honor to be in worship once again. We thank you that we have this privilege to sit under your word. We thank you, God, in light of what we're seeing over in other countries. Bombs are not bursting over our heads. God, fires are not breaking out, God. Bullets are not whistling by us. Here we are, God, in the house of God, able to sit here with our Bibles wide open, able to worship you in spirit and truth, not out of fear, not out of worry, but God, we purpose in our heart this morning to give you the glory, the honor, and the praises, for you alone are worthy. Thank you for this privilege this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you. God, moved by your spirit in this place, we pray that we would have an encounter with you. Speak now, God, for your servants are listening. Our tent doors are wide open. Our hearts are open. Our ears are open. Our eyes are open, God. Move in this place. Speak in this place. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, we have a lot of scripture to read here, so if you would indulge with me for a minute, would you just stand? I know, come on, let's do some exercise up and down and up. And down. Amen, amen, amen. I want to read this whole passage here in Acts 24 so that we can get the uh, big picture of this big story here. And then we'll drill down into some of these uh, little stories here. Amen? The Bible says in Acts 24, Now after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. The, these gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began an accusation saying, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept that always and in all places most noble Felix with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. 
He even tried to profane the temple. And we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Elias, came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered in as so much, as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor enticing the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with a tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me, while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement, which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Elias, the commander, come down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to for provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish, uh, he, he sent for Paul and heard him according to uh, concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him, more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius, Festus, succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Turn to your neighbor. Come on, don't look at me. Come on, you know, you know I said this all the time. Turn to your neighbor, look at your neighbor. That's your neighbor right there. That's your neighbor. You got three neighbors. Turn to your neighbor. How, say to them, how, do you deal with false accusations? How to deal with false accusations? How do you deal with false accusations? Have you ever been falsely accused of something? How did that make you feel? People generally feel indignant when they are accused of something that they did not do. It's a difficult thing 
to deal with when you are misunderstood and misjudged. All Apostle Paul wanted to do was to help people. He was living in obedience to Jesus and was sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, he was falsely accused just like Jesus was. How should we deal with false accusations? Different situations may call for different reactions. But I believe we can find some principles to guide us as we look more closely as these verses we just read. With God help, we can respond appropriately to those who treat us badly. I want all of us to know in here, all of us, you ought to write this down, you ought to be a pen and something written down in your mind and on, your, on the page. Listen, a life of integrity does not shield us or exempt us from being falsely accused. A life of integrity does not shield you or exempt you from being falsely accused. Somebody ought to say, you're right about that, preacher. Let's look at a few of these principles that will help us deal with false accusations. You know, I've been falsely accused. It was one of the hardest experiences I have gone through. We naturally shrink from criticism, even if it's justified or if an accusation is true. But when the charge is false, our natural sense of justice makes it almost unbearable. In those situations, we can learn a lot from Paul here in Acts 24. Here was one of God's choicest servants. He had been misunderstood and unappreciated by the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. He was falsely accused by some unbelieving Jews as he exited the temple. Everywhere Paul went in Jerusalem, he was misunderstood. He was falsely accused. And now in Acts 24, he finds himself in a Roman court, defending himself from false charges made by the leaders what amounted up to be the Jewish Supreme Court. What should we do when we face a, a, a situation like Paul? Should we defend ourselves or just lie down and take it? Or is there even a better way than these two extremes? By examining Paul's response to these false charges against him, let's see the three things that we should do when we are falsely accused. The first thing, the first thing here is right there in verses 1 to 8. I'm not going to reread them over, but it's, it starts right there in verses 1 to 8. The first verse says that the high priest, I, I, Ananias came with the leaders of the Jewish Supreme Court to prosecute Paul before Felix. The governor of the region encompassing Israel, they also brought along a man named Tertullus, what is called in the King James Version as an orator. Basically what he was, what we would call today a prosecuting attorney. And like many lawyers in his day, Tertullus was unscrupulous and open to the highest bidder, not caring if the charges he brought against Paul was true or not. He was also a Roman. And since the Jews did not understand the Roman law as well as the Romans, they hired Tertullus. After some flowery introductions in these first four verses, he talks about, you know, Felix is this great person, but, but the charges he brings are found in verses 5 to 6. I, I, I don't know about you, but I can picture myself seething with fury as Felix lied about me. I don't know about you, 
But it's hard when you know that you're walking right and you're doing right and you get these false charges, these false accusations. Somebody ought to testify here. Have you ever been falsely accused in the sanctuary? It's hard to sit there and just take it. The truth of the matter is most of us respond like Peter did. I, 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 you know, I, I, I would love to see some of us when we get falsely accused. You know what Peter did, right? Peter denied the Lord. And this young lady, while he was warming his hands around the fire, looked at Peter and said, you're a part of them, aren't you? Peter started cussing and swearing. I wonder, is that how some of us respond when we are falsely accused of something? Is our testimony the same? Do we look the same like we look on Sunday morning? With our halos on, with our Christian walk, our Christian talk, do we look the same way when we are falsely accused? I know for me, I know for me, because of where I came from, and many of us, because I came from the hood and because I came from Woodland Avenue, my natural inclination is to throw my hands up. You got to understand where I came from. It's about defending your rights. And if you let somebody punk you or call you out on something that you know ain't right, you will be a punk the rest of your life. I'm just letting you in into the hood, letting you understand a little bit about why uh, uh, you think or you perceive that black people might be angry all the time. It's not a thing of anger. It's a thing of standing on their rights. They have purpose in their heart. And nobody, again, is going to take what I rightfully deserve. So if you falsely make false accusations against me, I'm going to let you know. The sad to say is some folks don't, uh, don't have no filters. Amen. But thank Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. If you would have saw me before Jesus came into my Okay, how do you deal with false accusation? I've been lied on, cheated and talked about, mistreated. I've been used and scorned. The songwriter says, I've talked about so as born. But then they added this, as long as I got King Jesus. Amen. I thank God. As long as I got King Jesus in me, you'll never see me. You can tell folks that are walking in the Spirit. When King Jesus is walking in there, when false accusations come up, you see the difference in their response. Luke doesn't tell us exactly how Paul reacted emotionally during the prosecutor's slick oration. But Proverbs uh, 15, 5 helps us. He says that he that regardeth reproof is prudent. So Paul listened carefully before he responded. And I know that's hard for some of us. It's hard for some of us because it seems as though we got two mouths and one ear. But the Bible says that we ought to be swift to what? Listen and slow to do what? Reproof is prudent. When you regard reproof as prudent, our natural inclination is to instantly become defensive when someone accuses us. But if the truth be told, accusations often have at least some seed of truth in them, even if they're blown out of proportion. So when someone accuses you before responding Search your heart. See if there's even a grain of truth in the accusation. Ask yourself if you are exhibiting wrong attitudes that might have caused the person to feel justified in making his or her accusation. Ask your spouse. Ask the friend. Ask someone who will be honest and objective with you. 
and who will tell you if you have a blind spot in that area. All of us should say, ouch, because a lot of us don't want to be read. A lot of us don't really want to know the truth about ourselves. All of us in here have blind spots. All of us in here have some issues, some things about us that our dog has been barking and telling us we're wrong in. Our children has been telling us. Our neighbors, our loved ones, all of them people have been telling us that you got an issue in this area. I'll never forget, I'll never forget, I was at a conference and, he, and the uh, speaker started talking about sandpaper and talking about how God used sandpaper. And he said, listen, God is so awesome that he can, uh, if he wanted to, could come down and rub those areas in your life and expose those blind spots in your, in your life. But God chooses to use people as sandpaper. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand why Kelly would say, you know what, you need to stop acting this way. You need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. God was just using her as sandpaper. I was getting irritated, but that's what sandpaper ought to do to you, right? Sandpaper purpose is to irritate that area until it's smoothed out. Somebody ought to give God some praises for the sandpaper and the people God has put in your life to help you see those areas where you need to grow. Sandpaper people. That's what I want around me. I don't want yes people around me. I want some sand people around me, people that's going to rub up against me in spite of, you know you got to be some sandpaper people because God uh, picks and chooses those people because only certain people can deal with the friction that comes out of rubbing up against somebody that don't want to be rubbed up against. Woo! That was a word right there. Sometimes an accusation can be a source of growth in the area of your lives if we can just humble ourselves and be objective enough and to step back and be honest with ourselves. I like what Paul did next. Not only did he listen carefully, he also, in verses 10 to 21, he cheerfully made his defense. Paul didn't just lay down and say nothing and take a verbal beating unjustly. He was being wrong. And after listening to the charges, he knew he was totally innocent. So he gave a vigorous defense. The first, the first defense he gives is right here, but I, I, I like the substance of his defense. If you're going to defend yourself, you got to have some substance, something you can stand on. Paul briefly refuted every charge with his most powerful weapon, and that weapon was the truth. Because the truth always, I said always, rises to the top. Satan thought he had finished truth at Calvary. Truth was put in a borrowed tomb. But early Sunday morning, truth stepped up with all power in his head. You can't keep truth down. You ought to stand on the truth. First charge he stood on the truth was they said that he was a seditious troublemaker. He answered in verses 11 to 13. Look what he says, y'all. Because that thou may understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for worship. And they neither found in me the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they can accuse me. Verse 12, Paul, Paul points out that from the time he arrived until before the time he was arrested, his enemies could not point to one time in which he stirred up anyone or caused any trouble. So he says in verse 13, where's the proof? Where's the proof, he says? I wasn't in the temple rousing up folks and stirring up arguments. I wasn't in the synagogue or the city stirring up any trouble. 
If I was, where are the witnesses? Now, the Roman court wasn't like the kangaroo court that tried Jesus on trumped-up charges, used false and conflicting witnesses, and disregarded the rules of accepted jurisprudence. You had to produce proof in the Roman court. And Paul accuses, didn't have any. Paul knew, and his accusers knew it. So to the charge, the second charge they brought before him, Paul cheerfully defended himself. He said to the charge that he was a ringleader of an illegal sect. Paul was very shrewd when he spoke to them. He said, but I, verses 14 and 15, but this I confess unto thee. After the way which they called heresy, so I worship, I, the God of my fathers, believe in all the things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. In essence, he said, they call me a ringleader of a not allowed religion. But I believe all the things in the law and the prophets my accusers believe. I also believe in the resurrection of the dead. Do you believe that this morning? That one of these mornings, one of these getting up morning, we're going to fly away. And so shall we be with our Savior forever and ever for more. You ought to believe in the resurrection of the dead because if you don't believe in that, your faith, your belief is you've been, you've been, you know, Galatians said you've been bamboozled. You've been fooled. You fell for the okie doke. If you don't believe in the resurrection, Paul says, listen, I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the, the just and the unjust. One of these days, all of us, will have to come before the throne of God. I believe that. I believe that. That's part of the creed we sing. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yeah. What Paul did was tell the truth about the Christian faith. Christianity was illogical and God-ordained outgrowth, outgrowth of biblical Judaism. And to paint it otherwise was an unfair characterization because on most of the essentials of their faith, he and the Pharisees believe exactly alike. Their only point of contention, which is ours too, was the concerning the Messiah. That's a major point of contention, you know. If you don't believe in the Messiah, we got some problems. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, we got some problems. You ever have a preacher come up here and don't preach Christ, we got a problem. You ought to close your, put, put your clothes on, turn around, and go back out the church. If they don't preach the Messiah, preach Jesus Christ, everything in this church, everything we walk and talk about ought to be about Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. It's not about me. It's not about Stephen. It's not about the deacons. The, the uh, elder is nobody but Jesus. Nobody gets the glory. Nobody gets the honor. Nobody gets the praises. Nobody is lifted up. The only one is lifted up is Jesus the Christ. Because if it had not been for Christ, who was on our side, who delivered us, who healed us, who brought us a mighty, mighty long, he deserves all... That was Paul said, listen, that's my only contention. Uh, but not only that, the final charge that Tertullus brought before this court that Paul refuted cheerfully was that, that he had tried to desecrate the temple. Paul responds in verses 17 to 21. At the same time, we won't read all those verses, but here Paul gives a true account of what he was doing in the temple. He concluded if I am guilty of a charge so serious as desecrating the temple, those who saw me do it ought to be here to testify. It's amazing how folks will say stuff behind the scene. Folks will get on the internet, put stuff up there, 
post up on Instagram, talk behind your back, say all manners of things about you. But when it comes time to looking you face to face, they know where to be seen. That's what I like when I saw the Ukraine, you, 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 you came president, all this stuff was being said on those back channels, on Facebook, how they would get ready to give up, get ready to throw in, bow down to the Russian. This man stood on the truth. He said, I want to come out in front of everyone. I watched this yesterday on the TV. I want to refute every false accusation that have been posted on the internet. I want to tell the truth. I want to stand on the truth. No, we have not given up. I am here, I am not leaving. Our people are fighting, they are standing for their country. I love it when people stand for the truth. You got something against me, you got something against them, I go to them and speak to them. That's what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says, right? If you got an ought against your brother, you don't need to go gather some folks and build up your case like they did against Paul. You go directly to that brother, my sister, my brother, I, I got this issue with me. Can we just talk about it? And if you refuse, the Bible says then you go get a brother or a sister. And then you too go and talk to that sister or brother. But then if they refuse, then you take it to the leadership then the leadership will come and talk to that sister or brother. But then if they don't receive it from all of those people, the Bible says you ought to deal with that person correctly and let them know that you are not pleased. But this is the problem. Folks talk about you and all that stuff. Then when it's time, uh, mm, people are put out of churches because they've not responded to accusations and all that stuff, and then we tend to leave them right out there. But that's not what the Bible says. You leave them out there for a season, and then you go back to them. Amen. So many folks have been hurt by the church. We've done discipline correctly, but we missed the last point. We stopped going after that person that fell off. There's a lot of people out there still waiting mad at the church because nobody has come back to see them. Paul, Paul says, listen, if I'm guilty of a charge so serious of desecrating the temple, those who saw me ought to be here to testify. If they had any real evidence, they would have brought a witness. Having no witness was a stark witness to their flimliness of their case. Apostle Paul demonstrates to us to how to deal with false accusation, not with anger or emotion, but with the truth. The greatest weapon you have against false accusers on false accusation is the truth. I believe that because truth will make demons flee, truth will make the crooked straight, Cro truth will deliver you. Truth will keep you. Truth will keep your mind in its right place. You ought to plant yourself on truth. But I like this. Paul says in verse 10, I do it more cheerfully. Notice that Paul was not angry, but he answered cheerfully. When you know that you've done the right thing and you're in the right place and you know that your intentions were pure, you ought to cheerfully answer them not with seething with resentment, hurt, pride, or re righteous indignation or bitterness. Though he had every right Paul could have, he refused to do that. That's how often we are when we defend ourselves against false accusation. Why did Paul answer cheerfully? Because he, had, he knew he had a good conscience in the matter. He, he confessed in verse 16. Look at verse 16. He says that he always had a, a good conscience, a void of offense towards God and towards men. Paul knew he was innocent. So why get all worked up about it? 
Second, Paul knew that God was in control. Jesus stood by him in the first night of his prison ordeal and said to him, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Paul knew that God was in control. Like Paul, we can know with certainty that God has a destiny for us. God is in control of our lives. If we surrender to and be obedient to him, even in our jailhouse experiences. So when falsely accused, first, listen carefully to your accusers. Secondly, take appropriate action, even if partially guilty and if totally innocent. Cheerfully make your defense, knowing that the truth is on your side. And finally, Paul leaves the situation in God's hands. Verse 22 to verse 27. And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Elias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. The Bible says that Felix trembled. Now, I was talking to Pastor Stephan and Este a couple of days at lunch, and you know, sometimes, some passages, they just keep birthing sermons over and over again. Don't miss this point. This is a sermon in itself. The Bible says that Felix trembled as Paul preached and talked about the gospel. You'd be surprised. How many folks that had an encounter and had an experience with God have heard the word and the, the Holy Spirit made their soul tremble? And guess what? They walked away from that, looking for another time or another opportunity. Our text will teach and tell us that Felix will never get this opportunity again. Right here, Felix trembled, answered, and said, go thy way for this time. I will have, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He, hopped, he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him, uh, lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him to fit often and commune with him. But after two years, Portius Fetus came in to Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews pleasure, left Paul bound. Paul presented his case. The evidence was clear. He was obviously innocent. And as anyone could see, the Jews with their high-powered lawyer just didn't have a case. I like that. I like that because it teaches us that in spite of who we are and what we are and who we believe in, you know, we're always going to have people making accusations towards us. And it's not only people, because the Bible says that we have this great accuser of the brethren, that even right now, he's in the presence of God, accusing the brethren. And he has every right to accuse us, because he knows the word just like we do. So he goes before God in his presence, calls my name out. You know, Ron does not live like he ought to live. You know, he got some stuff going on in his life. He accuses us of missing the mark all the time, and we do. He accuses us just like he accused a Job in the presence of God. The only reason Job won't curse you because you got your hand on him. Take your hand off him and he will curse you. He accuses us all the time. 
He puts out the word right before God and says, look, they're not laying, walking in your word. Not only does he accuse me, but he accuses you too. And the truth of the matter, we all know that we drop the ball in here. We all mess up. We all come short of the glory of God. But I thank God in that courtroom. There's somebody else standing in that courtroom. Jesus, the high priest. Hallelujah. I thank God for Jesus who's sitting in and standing in that courtroom. And when every time the accuser of the brethren comes before God and demands God's justice, Jesus steps right in front of before God is ready to throw down the gavel of justice. Jesus steps before God and said, look at my hands. They were nailed to the cross for them. Look at my side. Woo, the accuser of the brother. Every day, every hour, he's accusing us. But I thank God that we got an intercessor who advocates for us day in and day night because he died. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended on high and sat down on the right hand side of God the Father. And every day, every hour, every minute, every second, he intercedes for us. And you ought to give God's praises because you do deserve God's wrath. God should have took us out a long time ago. But thank God for Jesus. If that don't get you excited, I don't know what will get you. Why don't we throw up a bomb in here? Maybe that'll make you run for Jesus. Jesus intercedes for you, right? <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 Jesus is interceding for you right now. You ought to give God some praises. You ought to throw up your hand. Thank Jesus, because you know you don't deserve to be here right now if it had not been for the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. All over the sanctuary, why don't you stand? All over the sanctuary, why don't you stand? The accuser of the brethren. He's accusing us right now. But thank God for Jesus that intercedes for us. We are so grateful. We're so thankful that Jesus intercedes for us. Today, my sisters and brothers, we all head bows. If you don't know Jesus and a part of your sin, I beg of you, I plead with you this morning that you will accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I don't know how you are making it without Jesus in your life. I can't make it without him. I need Jesus. Is there one today? Why don't you just slip up your hand? I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray with you and pray for you. Is there one that don't know Jesus in the pardon of their sins? Lift up your hand. Just lift it up high. I, said, I, I, I need this Jesus that you're talking about. I need him to intercede for me because I've been making all kinds of mistakes. I need him. Is there one today? Is there one? Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you. God, that when false accusations are made towards us, Paul teaches us some things, Lord, to listen carefully to cheerfully defend, and finally, to leave it in your hands. We pray, God, that as we are falsely accused, that we will apply this. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for this time. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.